equilibrium is no longer there. Right. And as a result of this, there is a, a fundamental weakening of the Islamic Republic inside the country. Now, whether this is going to lead to revolution or to a change of regime in the long run, I need more time, and I know my time is up. Maybe I can address it after he And I'm sure we'll get some questions on this. I'll be more than happy to discuss. Elias, there was an American angle to this drama, particularly in the second half of June. President Obama very um, clearly tried to keep the United States out of the middle of the problems within Iran. Was he correct in doing that? Or do you think he should have shown more um, appreciation, respect, support for the people who were putting their lives on the line in the streets? You know, Bernard Lewis once said that um, the United States is unpopular in those countries where the, where the population thinks there's a dictatorship and the Americans are supporting it, Egypt. And popular in those countries where is it, there is a dictatorship and the people think we are opposing it, Iran. I think we had a lot more leeway. I think uh, the president, I mean, the argument for the administration's policy was, let's not get in the middle of this. To me, the question was not getting in the middle of it. It was even getting on the outside of it. It was saying quickly, you know, it's obvious which side we're on. We are on the side of the people who are fighting for democracy there. I think it was particularly poignant because it's part of a broader pattern. The administration hasn't really done that in Venezuela. It hasn't really done that in China. It hasn't put us on the side of people fighting for democracy in their own countries. It wouldn't have taken much, and I think it was a mistake. You're in a former Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights. You spent a lot of time in the Bush administration trying to forward the principle of democracy. You think the Obama administration missed a chance to do that? I think so, you know, particularly if they want to move into negotiations. The danger of the negotiations, or a danger, is legitimizing the regime at exactly the wrong moment. You can avoid that really the way Reagan did in his negotiations with the Soviets, which is to say you negotiate with them because they're there while denouncing them, I mean, while saying evil empire. That didn't stop the negotiations with the Soviets. So what he did do was to make it clear to the people of the Soviet Union whose side we were on. Now we're entering into these negotiations at a moment when it is less clear than it should be. The administration has given off a kind of whiff of unhappiness with these demonstrations that have slowed down its negotiating. There was, there was obviously a rationale to Obama's policy, and I think it was that there was a concern that if the United States injected itself into the middle of the political debate in Tehran, we would have become an actor. Ahmadinejad would have been able to say, perhaps with some credibility, the US is interfering in our system. I actually defended President Obama on this. I thought he made the right call, but we'll just disagree on that. But I want to get to the question you've just posed and ask Mohsen to jump in here. The Obama administration is now going to negotiate mm -hmm. with a government that has just put forward a brutal <coughs> crackdown and imprisoned lots of people, murdered some people. Mm -hmm. Will we now legitimize <coughs> President Ahmadinejad by sitting down with him? Is engagement the right way to go with Iran? I know this is not the right place to quote the former Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumpfeld, but I'm going to. It could be. <laughs> it depends uh, what you say. When people... <laughs> During the height of the Iraq war, when, they, when uh, he was being criticized for not sending enough troops or equipment to Iraq, he said something like, you go to war with the army you have, mm -hmm. not with the army you want to have. Well, you negotiate with the government that is in power, not with the government that you think should be in power or you desire to be in power. It is very strange because the same people who have been against negotiation with Iran before, nine, before June uprising are the same people who are saying now, don't negotiate because it is not a, a legitimate government. Well, they said it wasn't a legitimate government before. I, I, have to, I have to disagree with that. I think of Iran experts like Karim Sajapur and Shaul Bakhash, mm -hmm. who were engagers before June and who are now saying it's awfully dangerous and the risk of legitimizing them is too great. So there are some people who flipped. But I was talking about, uh, not them, I was talking about people who have always been against uh, uh, negotiation. I was in favor of engagement, I still am, but I'm much more qualified in mm. what I propose precisely because of what happened in Iran. But going back to your question, 
Uh, I believe uh, the US has negotiated with governments that have been much more brutal and much more regress, uh, repressive than the Islamic Republic. Such I, as or North Such Korea. as the Soviet Union. We started negotiating with Joseph Stalin right after, well, we, know, we uh, uh, recognized the Soviet Union right after the, uh, the massacre of at least 20 million people by Joseph Stalin. We have negotiated with Mao Zedong. We went, uh, the American uh, uh, government started secret negotiations with Mao Zedong at the height of the Cultural Revolution. And I think they did the right thing. I'm not criticizing that. I think you have to negotiate with your enemy as long as you know what you want, as long as you go to the negotiation table with a definitive uh, 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 agenda and you're self-confident about what you do, it doesn't matter who the other person is. And I think it would be a huge mistake for the United States to get itself involved in the internal struggle in Iran today. I think what President Obama did during the uh, uh, street demonstrations, what he did publicly is absolutely correct, and I give him A plus. As a professor, I usually do not give more than C plus, but in his case, <laughs> he gets an A plus. You should come to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and one of the, and to get to your point, Mosin, which I think was a very good one, one of the, the issues that the Obama administration has, has um, brought forward is that we're dealing with nuclear weapons here. There is a timeline. At some point in the future, Iran will likely become a nuclear weapons capable straight state. If you hold off on negotiations, you rob yourself of the opportunity to actually influence that government in some way. But that depends on one assumption, Elliot, that the negotiations can be successful. Do you think mm -hmm. they can be? What's the likelihood that when the US starts on October 1st, say by January 1st, 2010, these negotiations will be moving forward and not backward? Very slow. I mean, remember that the position of the United States was we will not negotiate until there is a freeze on enrichment. That, that was, was the Bush administration. That was the Bush administration. Not Bush the Obama administration. administration. But they have come in and said we want freeze for freeze. And then they've said we will only negotiate if we can discuss nuclear weapons. So the Iranians issue a five-page paper and then make speeches. No discussion of nuclear weapons. The administration is great. We'll see you tomorrow. Now, that is not a firm negotiating stance. That's the first problem. The second problem is that they're certainly not going to work without the pressure of sanctions. And the pressure of sanctions, you know, the day after the Soviet foreign minister, the Russian foreign minister said, uh, we don't really think sanctions are a good idea. Uh, the threat of sanctions is, is pretty slim right now. So I wonder what, what it is that is the pressure on Iran that would make it change its position. And negotiations are really supposed to be more than just chatter. But I wonder if we have the wherewithal to do more than chatter at this point. So let's think down the chessboard a little bit. Let's play this out. Negotiations start on October 1st. I think the three of us would probably say, we talked ahead of time, that those negotiations are likely to fail. Should they fail, Mosin, President Obama would be able to turn back to another part of, of his playbook, what Elliot just mentioned, sanctions. Now, we've tried sanctions, three Security Council resolutions we passed between 06 and 08, largely ineffective. Mm -hmm. Didn't seem to have any impact on the Iranian government. Is there a possibility for a stronger sanctions regime? And should energy sanctions on Iran be part of that? Well, first, we have to take the route of negotiations with Iran. And this five-page proposal that Iran has uh, sent out remind me of what we used to do in, uh, in uh, elementary school in Iran, we used to write uh, compositions. Is wealth better than knowledge? That was a typical question. Another one was war. How did you answer it? Well, I, <laughs> I made a mistake. I said knowledge. Um, <laughs> that's, your, that's your academic career. That's I right. Okay. And then another question was war or peace? Th that five-page proposal is basically a uh, sort of very sophomoric proposal. But it was deliberate, because this is the way Iranians negotiate. When you go to a Persian a carpet a shop, and uh, the, the person looks at you and figures out that you're interested in that specific carpet. If you ask him, what is the price? He'll tell you this is not for sale. <laughs> and then once he knows more about you, he's going to sell you that rug. What Iran believes it has is, is its nuclear capability. 
And if you expect the Iranians to come and give it away at the beginning of negotiations, then you're underestimating the shrewdness of these people. So you'd give the negotiations time, it sounds like. You wouldn't give it a month. You might give it, what, six months, a year? I, I think it would take at least six months to a year before the negotiators can look at each other's eyes and they develop trust. For 30 years, they have been not uh, trusting each other. And would you insist at some point, if, let's say you're the American negotiator, yes. would you insist that Iran freeze its nuclear research efforts during the negotiations? If you don't, then they're simply going to play out the clock. If I would have been the negotiators, I would not even start with the nuclear issue. I would start on a number of other issues. I would build confidence, but then I would give myself a year. I would tell them, look, we are going to do X and Y, so you know we are sincere. But be aware. What is X and end, Y? Such as what is going on in Afghanistan, what is going on in Iraq. You mean threatened military force? No, I'm talking about cooperation between Iran and the United States ah, okay. in terms of building confidence. Mm -hmm. But then I would put a time limit that at the end of the year, once we have developed, once we have built confidence, this is what we expect. At that time, I think once that confidence is built, then I'm in favor of freeze for freeze. And very quickly, I want to get back to give Elliot a chance. Would you leave the threat of military force on the table as you were negotiating if you were an American? I think the threat of military force should be removed from the table, but it should be brought back. And when it is brought back, America should be damn serious about using it. Okay. For 30 years, they've been threatening. They haven't used it. Okay. Remove it and then bring it back. Elliot, now we're continuing to, to play this out. Mossad has his way. Negotiations are held. Let's say they fail. That's the likeliest outcome. Let's say we try the international community sanctions. China and Russia do not participate in those sanctions because they disagree. Therefore, it's a Swiss cheese sanctions regime. They don't work. At that point, hypothetically, would you recommend that the U.S. use military force against Iran to slow down or impede its nuclear weapons research program? I would recommend either that we do or that Israel does. I think you have to start from your conclusion. What do you think about Iran's getting nuclear weapons? Is it, you know, on balance not a good thing, or is it something that you're prepared to act to prevent? That is to say, you need to envision a world and a Middle East in which this regime, not Iran, this regime uh, has nuclear weapons. Um, what is the impact on the 60 years of efforts to prevent nuclear proliferation? What is the impact in the Middle East, and in the Persian Gulf in particular? Um, if you need to make your decision about that, and then, in a sense, reason backwards. Because if your view is, well, it's not that terrible. I mean, you know, we'll work it out. Then, obviously, you should not use military force. If your view is that this is a game changer, and it has to be prevented. And by the way, I mean, President Obama has said about 300 times, it's unacceptable to us. I don't know what unacceptable means except. Do you think he would use, he, President Obama, knowing who he is, how he's governed so far, do you think ultimately, if everything else failed, he would order an American military attack on Iran? You know, I'm no intimate of President Obama's, but given the record of eight months, I would say no. Let me ask you this. Let's say that and, you're. And, and that, but let me just say, this is a problem, a problem with the negotiation. I don't agree with uh, Mosin that you know, the key thing is to build trust between the negotiators. Even if they have trust, look, Javier Solano is a wonderful guy. He's trustworthy. His negotiations with the Iranians <clears throat> for several years now have been useless. They've, all they've done is produce gray hair for Solana. So well, you're now committed, at least in this hypothetical scenario, to be an advocate of the potential possible use of mil US military force, like any good foreign policy expert, you would also think about the ramifications of the use of force before you ordered an airstrike. You'd say, how would Iran react? Right. Would Iran attack the United States, Israel, the Palestinian Authority, through Hezbollah and mm -hmm. Hamas? Could Iran pose problems to the United States in Iraq and Afghanistan? Could we handle a third war in the Middle East in one decade, a third war simultaneously no. with the two others? What about those consequences? <clears throat> Does that make you pause a little bit? Sure, you have to have a view of, first of all, can you do this? 